I grew up in a very, very remote part of Australia. In fact, it was a national park called the Snowy Mountains. We're not good at naming things in Australia. <laughs> and there was basically two families who lived there, our family and another family. If I had to distill it down to anything, the one thing that I always, whether it's something when I was younger or even now when I'm reviewing work for my teams, and I'm very privileged to have about 700 people in our New York office, the thing that I always get to is I'm not out to prove how creative I am. I'm not out to prove how artsy I am or anything like that. I always judge things by why would the person or people on the receiving end of this care about this? Why should they care about this? I know when I present to a client, they're invested, they care about it. And I know the, the agencies, they care about it, but why would the person who's going to receive this care about this? And don't forget, our industry now as well is somewhat under duress. People have invented technology to avoid what we create. Okay? Just think about that as a starting place for an industry when you're telling your kids, yeah, yeah, people create technology to skip whatever you make. That's terrifying. But at the same time, it's fantastic if you're a creative person because it's put the onus back on advertisers and storytellers to create stuff that's worthy of people's attention. So I was going to show you some examples today, but you know, last night I was at a fabulous dinner and a lot of people were saying, oh, are you going to show this piece or are you going to talk about this piece? And a lot of our you know, greatest hits, I'm not going to do that because you know, I have this weird dumb rule in the office and for myself, which is I never show clients anything that's older than a year old because it forces us to live up to what we're doing right now. So I'm not going to show you the, sh the great schleps and the uh, echoes and the underarmers and all that sort of stuff. No, for me, I want to sort of show you some of the things that we've been trying to do just in the last 12 months that hopefully show you a range of thinking, a range of ambition. And that's what I also love about our industry is it doesn't cost more to do something well. Actually, one would argue it costs less to do something well than to do it badly. And I was very fortunate when I was, when I was younger, I had this sort of, I don't know, it's not really an epiphany, actually, it's probably pretty obvious, is it takes the same amount of energy to try and do something great as it does to justify something mediocre. So why the hell not try and do something great? And that's, that's sort of been my outlook all the way along. Now, the industry in, in America is enormous. And again, as I said from the, the outset, to me it's always surprised me about the opportunities. But such is the formulaic nature and template templatization of our industry, that when you do something that is out from the norm, the amount of people that want to collaborate with you, the doors just burst open, and that's where it gets so exciting. So the first thing is a client that's actually very dear to my heart, and that is, should be your favorite client as well, Australia. <laughs> now, the weird thing about um, Australia, apart from being awesome, uh, is that, like with all clients, they all think that their, their brand is the best of everything, right? So when a client like the brand Australia, which actually, you know, this is, this is a client with 24 million marketing directors, right? And they're probably the only thing that my family will give a shit about when I go home, to give me an opinion on what I do for Australia, is they said to me, well, you know, we need to sell Australia. It's got fantastic beaches exotic animals, great food, great climate. Where else has that? Almost every other country, right? <laughs> so the key is, how do you tell these great things about a country but find something unique about a country? And for me, or well, the teams we were working on, this is where the arrogance kicks in, I was like, the most unique thing about Australia isn't our koala bears, although they're awesome, and our beaches, and our food, and our wines. It's Australians. True. Fact. You can't argue with that. You don't have them. <laughs> but it's the Australians, and it's the Australians' nature. It's the Australians' irreverent personality. Anyone who knows an Australian, they're you know, a good person to have in a company, in a bar, and all that sort of stuff. Like Australians, we don't take ourselves too seriously. And we thought, how can we demonstrate that, but at the same time, get across, in a stealth way, the virtues of our country? So, this was 12 months ago. We decided to do something that was a little bit subversive, but at the same time, be playful and fun. So what we did was, I don't know if it was big here, but in America, I hate to say it, but one of the most famous things that people know about Australia was the movie Crocodile Dundee, which was very defining for us. So we decided, for, good, for better or worse, 
So we decided to do the most Australian thing, which was to convince the entire country that we were going to make a sequel to Crocodile Dundee. So we started with this trailer went out without any, any um, context. Hey, losers. Yo, where the kangaroos at? Brian Dundee? Yep. Really? Yeah. Really? Why do you keep saying really? What do you mean Dundee's lost in the outback? He is the outback. Nobody talks about Mick like that. Careful with that knife, mate. It's pretty sharp. A knife? How big? What do you mean there's two of them? Have you ever seen a humpback whale give birth? It's a bloodbath. Speak to me, little guy. Now, when your dad did it, he was he was much. Okay, and when my dad told me about this, he was just like, yeah, I just came up and he did this, okay? okay? I just don't think he can see you from back here. I don't just own this newspaper, son. I own this country. And Dundee's gonna learn who the most dangerous animal in Australia is. It's me. Whatever. Yeah! My mom's <laughs> side of the family are all jazz musicians, so it kind of comes natural comes. to me. Wow, wow, I'm back. So we, we put that out into the universe, and think people, you know, you can imagine how polarizing it was. The whole of America sort of went, became obsessed about there was going to be a remake. And again, for context, we had to make it kind of bad enough that it might have been a remake, you know, that they would have cast an American to be the son of Dundee, all this kind of stuff. But by the way, it's, all those stars did that for free. For free. Again, when you have an idea that people want to be part of that's mutually beneficial, and for context, Russell Crowe was wearing no pants. I don't know why he wanted to do the shoot with no pants. <laughs> That's true. That's true. He turned up on the set with no pants. We're like, oh, whatever you want, Russell. Um, but again, so it sort of created this, this hype and this speculation. And then in the Super Bowl, which anyone who knows about the Super Bowl in America, it's like so obsessive, the Super Bowl, what happens. Like, it's the only time America cares about advertising, genuinely. And there's almost like this arms race to create work that punches through. So... If that had gone out before, and then we played this commercial in the Super Bowl, there's a little bit of redundancy because some of it is the same, but... That's not a knife. That's a knife. <laughs> That's me. Brian Dundee? Yep. Really? Yeah. Really? Why do you keep saying really? You right there, mate? Nothing to see here, man. Just getting a clean shave with my machete. See you next week, Barry. You know, when your dad did it, he was he was much... Okay, and when my dad told me about this, he was just like, yeah, I just came up and he did this, okay? I just don't think he can see you from back here. out here, huh? It's just 37,000 miles of pristine, beautiful beach, mate. Did you know that Australia makes some of the finest wines in the entire world? No, I, 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 I didn't know that. Thank you very much. Wait, hold up. This isn't a movie. No. It's a tourism ad for Australia. Yes. But listen, you're the best Crocodile Dundee since Crocodile Dundee. Really? Yes, really. Mm. And we had the best trip ever, didn't we? It was pretty sweet. Hey, you know, there are some great flight deals to Australia right now. Dude, I get it. It's not a movie, it's a commercial. So... (laughs) 
The thing about that is, and, and obviously then the whole campaign at all levels switched from what was movie posters and movie sites and all that switched to Australia, you know, come to Australia. What's been amazing about that is, and the government said this, it might be the most effective thing I've ever done actually, because there was a government report that said increased revenue from, uh, of, of American tourists to Australia in the first half of the year was $6 billion. I'm like, okay, can't argue with that one. <laughs> New York Times means a lot to me personally, means a lot to uh, anyone who gives a shit about real journalism. Journalism is, journalism is under attack, and New York Times is sort of one of the, the, the most important news organizations in, in the world. And they've asked us, and we've been working with them to create a campaign that has not only done wonders for their business, and their, their business is up for the first time in 20, 30 years, and digitally and subscription, but this is an example of, well, we don't have to try and prove how clever we are. There's nothing we do as an agency that is going to be more impressive than what they do as journalists. It's just never going to happen. So our job, we've created this whole platform called The Truth is Worth It for The New York Times. And we just want to remind people what goes in to real stories, real journalism. And so we've created, there's been so many elements to this campaign, digitally, out of home. But these are some films that just um, broke in the last few weeks. And I'll show, there's eight of them, I'm not going to show you eight, I may show you one or two. But what we tried to do was deconstruct what it takes to get to their stories and their headlines, just using real audio, real um, footage and photos, and across topics, and they range from Trump's taxes to ISIS to immigration to Mexican spyware, everything. But this is one that goes out next week. from the New York Times. Yeah. I am trying to understand the ideology of ISIS. How does ISIS to kill people? You had to know how to slice the head off. The blood was everywhere. You didn't question that? I didn't know. But what the hell did I just do? Just do it. It's voicemail. What's amazing with, the, with, the, with this campaign is to act, it's, it's such church and state between the, the, the newsroom and obviously the marketing department. It's the first time that they've actually come together because we're not trying to trample on anything they do. We're just trying to create, have enough clarity. One thing that's not really shown in advertising, designers are much better than, than um, advertising people, is restraint. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I feel like that's what we're really trying to do is, is have enough restraint and create something, a platform that allows these stories to be told. And, now it's got to the stage where the, the, the journalists are all vying for us to tell the backstories of their stories. And it's, uh, it's pretty amazing. And again, that doesn't really cost a lot of money. It costs a lot of time because it's the editorial, ed the finding the editing and stuff like that. But again, just do it in a way that's... I'll show you one more just because it's... 
I like this. There's been reports that you are considering separating children from their mothers at the border. Only if the situation requires it. So if you thought the child was in danger, sure. that's the only circumstance to which you would separate. Can't, can't imagine doing it otherwise. Hi, it's Caitlin Dickerson from the New York Times calling you back. Do you make your first and last name? Caitlin Dickerson. See. I have to call one woman to ask her about I'm an immigration reporter here at the Times. This isn't the only case. Please be in touch as soon as possible. Can't imagine doing it. I know that's not true. Ms. Caitlin Dickerson here at the Times. We can talk by landline phone. I can take you at your house. And the shelters really don't know what to do with them. Well, there's, there, there's a lot of work. There's a lot of work, obviously, behind all that. But again, it's it's amazing when you strike an, a, a chord. And it, you know, as I said, journalism is under under duress at the moment. But it's it's amazing how just standing for something, getting to the core or essence of why something exists, and that's our job essentially as marketers is to just you know interrogate a brand until it confesses what it really is. And sometimes that's easy, and sometimes that's difficult. But um, you know, the New York Times is, is so defined and they're so set in who they are. And what's amazing now is, you know, now it's almost become a pop culture thing where it's sort of, from the effectiveness of what it does, do you have, you know, from Meryl Streep standing up at, 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 at award shows to NBA athletes wearing shirts that just all say, you know, the truth is worth it. New York, you know, people want to get behind things that have belief systems. And the privilege of, of our clients and the agencies, I mean, and the the clients that come to us is they, they know we're going to care about what we do. And that doesn't mean everything is as heady as that, as I said, you know, but it's, you know, I always say to all our clients, you pay us not to agree with you, you pay us to have an opinion. You don't have to take my opinion, but I'm always going to give you my opinion. And we're not there to take dictation. And so much of advertising was created as just process. We were selling process, not a thinking about like every opportunity is an opportunity to create a, an impact. Every opportunity is, is, is can a chance to be visceral. As I said, it can be fireworks or it can be lighthouses, but it's amazing. And, and people put this money in, you know, maybe it suits my lack of attention span or my not wanting to be um, put in one box or one container where I do like to sort of try and work on things that have this disparate personality in nature. And again, you know, we're privileged to have the opportunities we get. Again, great ideas break down walls, great ideas people want to be part of. So I had to, um, HBO, which is the big um, television producer, film producer. Do they have Game of Thrones here? Yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Remember, I'm an idiot, right? We've established that. Um, so we, Game of Thrones has asked us to do the, the entire launch for their final season, and they don't really need to advertise. It's the biggest entertainment property in the history of entertainment but I think they just wanted to flex their muscles and show that they, um, they can do what they want. So we've created lots and lots of different things that are starting to go out now, but in the Super Bowl, we decided, to, I had to call a client that's not mine, because I have another beer client, but there's a, the biggest beer in America is called Bud Light, and Bud Light, for the last two years, have spent hundreds of millions of dollars building up these characters with like a, a medieval king, and they've actually had the Bud Knights, that's their idea, not mine. Um, you know, it's been this character on all TV. You can't escape the Bud Knight on television. 
So I had to beg, borrow, steal, convince, da da da, and so we ran this Super Bowl commercial. And in fact, and I even had to call the agency of Bud Light, which is uh, uh, Wyden Kennedy, and a good friend of mine, Colleen, runs that. And I called her and said, Look, I've got this bonkers idea. I've already convinced your client to do it, but I want you to do the front part, and when it changes over, you'll get it. So this played in the Super Bowl. I think it might have blown people's. It's a beautiful day for a joust. Indeed. Sun's out. Got my lucky loincloth, cold Bud Light, comfy throne. I don't have the plague anymore. Look, it's the Bud Light. <laughs> One more. All right, let's tap this cake. I have to say, that was so much fun to do, and I think America is still in shock. I think a lot of people choked on their chicken wings because, <laughs> you know, as I said, the, the Bud Light stuff is always light, light-hearted comedy, and we sort of used all their characters, and, we, you know, we had to do what Game of Thrones always does, which is, you get killed. You know what I mean? <laughs> What's the saying from Game of Thrones, if you know? If you think it's going to end nicely, or you think it's going to end well, you haven't been paying attention. But the thing about it is, is again, an idea, and, and the idea in this for the Game of Thrones is all built around the premise of for the throne, which is bigger than just executions. I always, definitely, what, whatever we do with our clients, we try and sell platforms that are bigger than an execution. I never want to be hung, you know, I'm never going to die on my sword for just an execution. That's missing the big picture. You know, like for the New York Times, the truth is worth it. That's what I care about. I care about and I'm confident enough that we can do stuff that resonates if some stuff doesn't make it through. And same with HBO for the throne on a smaller level. But it, it can straddle different tones. So the thing that just launched, or was about to launch in two weeks as well, one of the other five other things that's happening for Game of Thrones, knowing that people are obsessed, how do we exploit for the throne? What would people do for the throne? So we're launching globally, actually. Now, I, think it's going to, I think it's going to be here at the Red Cross, but with all Red Crosses, as far as I'm concerned, around the world, we're launching a thing called Bleed for the Throne, which is essentially, if you go to any Red Cross and donate a pint of blood or quarts of blood. You get to watch a teaser that no one else is going to be able to watch, and you can also potentially win tickets to go to the premiere with all the stars. So it's, it's again, like, what, how, do you, how do you turn things into, sometimes it can be fun and lighthearted and subversive, and other times, if it's appropriate, how do you turn something into where there can be a material positive impact? And there's lots and lots of different things. There's about another six or seven things that I can't tell you about, because the client would kill me if I launched those ones. But, the range, you know, that's what we always try and do. Like, we always try to play with, you know, just because I don't want to be expected. I don't want, you know, that, the problem with advertising is, 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 again, in our industry, people talk about the word disruption. Like, it, they say it with pride. I'm like, bullshit disruption. I don't want to be a disruptor. I don't want to interrupt anybody in anything. You know what I mean? I want to do stuff that people seek out and, and appreciate. And how we do that, it can come in many different phases and manifest itself in different ways. But... You know, let's do stuff that adds value. And add value, as I said, can work in different, different ways. Sometimes money corrupts production. And all, people always think, oh, America, you have unlimited funds. And yes, some of those things look ex hugely expensive. New York Times isn't. But sometimes, again, it's not about money. It's about an idea. It's about an emotion. It's tapping into a, into a truth or something that's a zeitgeist of what's going on now. And we do all the stuff from Under Armour. And there was one thing we did, which was 
using Giselle, who was one of their, um, is one of their athletes. Um, but she's a kick-ass, she's a kick-ass woman, and she's, but we decided, you know, we created this whole big brand campaign for them, which is, uh, for the women's campaign, which is, I will what I want, which is, I do everything on my terms, not on expectations of what other industries or people think. And we thought, wouldn't it be interesting, you know, Giselle is shown in all her Chanel ads and all that with, you know, looking like a billion dollars or whatever, you know, looking like 280 million dollars, whatever she looks like. Um, but I always show it in the same traditional cliched way and we thought, you know, let's show how fierce she really is and if she really is fierce, is she willing to know that because people call her out, if you go online, the amount of love and hate for someone like that is immense. So we convinced her to, be, well, just to film her doing her daily routine of kick-ass stuff that we were just going to project in real time what's being said about her online right now, the good or the bad. And this was, a, it was not only a film, but it was an online experience so that any time that you went online, it was different because we, we basically invented the mapping that would project, change it. I'll just show you the film because it was... Again, so just sort of going to the thought of like, actually, some, sometimes you can just, technology can be your friend, what's going on now? Like, there are so many levers that you can pull, but if it all comes back to sort of something that's true about the brand and who you're doing and nothing generic about it, and I also, I like the tension of making something at stake. Not, there's no danger or anything like that, but where something matters, it's not just superficial. So much of advertising is patronizing. It just is, and that's probably why people hate it so much. You know what I mean? People hate advertising. As I always say, people hate advertising until they lose their cat. Then they love advertising. <laughs> but when, unless there's something personal to them, they don't care about it. But when it's done well, it's phenomenal. This is a campaign that we just launched, like two days ago. One, I'm going to show you one thing we just launched and one thing that's launching next week. Um, Nordstrom, again, I'm, and I'm, as I said, showing you stuff that's just recent, but also stuff that's in very different categories, because I sort of want to show you how we, our, our way of trying to bring some essence and humanity out in whatever we do. So Nordstrom is a huge department store, fashion department store in the, in the US, and as with most massive industries, you know, they make it all the same. Everyone's trying to appeal to the masses and not be distinctive. And also, we're in a very divisive time now in the US where people are picking sides about things. And, you know, no one wants to be an individual anymore. Everyone has to, you have to pick a team, not just politics, you have to pick a team. And we're just like, let's just get back to celebrating the quirkiness and the individuality. And this is all built around the idea, which is the platform we've launched for the client, which is an open mind is the best look, which is just very much like this, no matter what you dress and how you dress, like, what's going on in your head and how you think, is that's, that's the best look you can have. So we went and got, not no actors, we went and found real people and we got an improv um, uh, teacher, which is really what life is about. We're all improv artists every day, right? That's all we're doing. Really. And we just had her improv about like the voiceover to the thing, which sort of became the sort of the manifesto for this. Look at me. Mean what you say. Look at me. Give it back to her. I want to have a human experience. Who are you in this sculpture? Find yourself. Three, good job. Steady, yeah? Move quietly. Find the passion.
connect with each other. Make your place, take your spot. You look nervous, what's wrong? Kinda am. Look around, look up, look all around. Take in your entire environment. Be a big bear. Good, embody your power. Think of who you are in this culture. Connect with each other. Stop. So the thing that I was <laughs> so more than that film, that's just one film. But again, what I like about the, the, the lane that we're choosing that's authentic to Nordstrom is just the attitude of an open mind is the best look. And from that, it's what can come. It doesn't always have to be one, two minute films or anything like that. It's just a, a point of view. And most brands don't have a point of view that they can justify or more importantly, that they can stand behind. Everybody wants to be popular and in the middle, but not distinctive enough because they don't want to offend anyone. Just to get, like, pick, pick what you stand for. If we do it as individuals, hopefully. <laughs> you know, brands are citizens too, if, if that makes any sense. And again, when you have a platform, I, I like things where, going back, where there's some visceral emotion from you. You know, as a simple person. And from that also comes, and this next film I'm going to show you, I have no idea why I love it so much. There's no logical reason. It's so silly and quirky, but it's just one of the guys from this, um, who was on this shoot, and he was just a, a, a small player in this, and he turned up to the set with his homemade instrument, and we just filmed it, and he just made up a song. And so this is going to be broadcast across the whole of America next week, but it's just something lovely, and it's not trying too hard. For me personally, you may think I'm nuts, but uh, let's see. This is a song of a human being, human being, I love you, human being, just to be human being, human being, you know why, I love you, you can reveal to be so lovely, to be so nice, human being, I love you. Thank you. Good. Thank you. <laughs> I'm actually so happy for that guy because, as I said, he was just this, you know, just one part player in a film, and now he's going to have this national campaign across America <laughs> with a song that he probably made up on the way to the shoot. And as I said, I can't get that song. I, my kids now walk around the house saying, "Human being, I love you," because <laughs> I should. But again, sometimes it, sometimes logic paralyzes us. Sometimes just doing something that's beautiful and means something and it's just a feeling. And that's what I'm trying to do. Like, you know, I grew up, as I said, going way back to where I started. I grew up in a household where my father was, you know, a businessman and my mother, who is an artist and a poet and an environmentalist. You know, she was like, I just, you know, just do something that you care about and try and have a positive impact. And my dad was like, be a success. So I'm <laughs> very different. Obviously, they're not married anymore. But, <laughs> but from that came this thing for me, which was like, you know what? I want to be someone that can not feel bad about being successful, but feel great about how I'm successful and what I put out into the universe. And without compromise. I have you know, three of my brothers are in finance and very successful businessmen. And you know, I've got three other siblings who are 
art sculptors and, and uh, you know, run NGOs and they're amazing people. And I feel like that I'm right in the middle and I get to experience and do these incredible things. And I get paid to daydream. Anybody in this room, which I'm assuming is everybody, who gets paid for, to put your opinion and your imagination and your thought process and your belief system on a piece of paper or in a design or on film, we are the lucky ones. And as the world gets automated and all our jobs, not our jobs, but all the jobs that we know of out there are disappearing, the one thing that's going to be the hardest to get rid of is the original thinkers. That's, that's true, thank God. Thank God. We are, we, are, we are in the time of the creative thinkers because, you know, people maybe have heard me say this before, you know, linear, logical, linear and logical people make the world go round, but it's the creative people who make it worth living in. And that's the, that, that's the sort of world that I want to be part of. So I'm trying very hard. I'm privileged to have um, had you know, some uh, phenomenal people working with me who make me look good. But uh, just, just caring matters. And I hope that you've, you know, there's a little window into what we're doing. As I said, that's just some of the stuff we've just done of late. But um, thank you very much. It's been a privilege, and uh, I appreciate it. Thank you.